Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome to another video in this Skew T and Hodograph series. Now, it's been a little bit of time since we um, had our last video. I had some uh, traveling to do, some things to take care of. So, um, but we're gonna get back on the horse today. And um, in the past few videos, we've talked about all the different parameters that you can find directly from a Skew T. Uh, now we're gonna talk about the characteristics of the Skew T itself. So in this video we're going to look at a few different common sort of signatures you might see on skew T's and what they mean. And then in the next video we're going to look at um, some different skew T's for different environments, how they modulate, uh, what severe weather hazards you might see, whether or not you'll see storms, etc. So let's get started here and the first sort of common feature of a skew T that you will often see is called an inversion and an inversion. So as we know the temperature decreases with height in the atmosphere but an inversion is where the temperature increases with height. So if we're looking at our sample sounding on the right here we're gonna look for any areas where the sounding the temperature profile which is the of course the red line here as we've learned here in this series. Uh, we're gonna look for any place where it kind of skews back toward the right which would indicate that it would increase with height and you can see right about starting at about 850 millibars in this kind of shallow layer right here the temperature definitely increases pretty significantly with height so starting at the surface the temperature is decreasing 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 with height then at about 850 millibars uh, it abruptly changes to the temperature increasing with height and that's an inversion so you can have multiple inversions on a sounding and we'll talk about a few different common ones that you might see uh, the first one being the morning inversion. Oftentimes after a uh, sort of clear night um, you will see this in the morning where you have the surface temperatures that are much much cooler than the layer just above it. So you can see here on our sample sounding surface temperature is at 54 and then the temperature profile really kinks off to the right there and then it goes back to decreasing with height. So inversion centered at the ground and this happens because of something called radiational cooling and radiational cooling is a something that happens often and most prominently on clear nights so according to Planck's law which is a law of uh, you'll you'd learn about it in, in radiation courses but Planck's law states that every everything emits thermal radiation to some capacity and when you're talking about a clear cool night and you're looking at the surface say these are these are buildings here everything at the surface is going to radiate heat back out to space and it does everything you know buildings trees the surface itself etc all that thermal radiation is lost to space so that the temperature is very near to the surface cool quite significantly overnight whereas the layer just above it does not so you often see these kind of inversions early in the morning on morning soundings um, be on usually on clear nights you can often see this as well uh, when we're trying to pick out fronts on soundings now there are many you know different ways to pick out fronts you know you look at the service map and whatnot but we can actually um, often delineate fronts from skew T's. So think about a mass of warm air. And then you have a cold front that is approaching from the west here. That cold front is going to undercut the warm air because it's steeply sloped. Frontal zones are not um, completely straight in the vertical. Most often they are sloped backward and so that cold front, which is more steeply sloped than a warm front, that cold air is going to undercut that warm air and push it upward. So on soundings like this one at the right here, you'll see cooler temperatures at the surface, which is that um, indication of the cold front. And then you'll see a pretty rapid increase in temperature with height, which is that warmer air that's gotten displaced upward as that cold front kind of wedged underneath it and undercut it. Now fronts are not not always um, very easy to pick out on soundings, but um, you'll often see something like this if you do try to pick out a front on a sounding. 
Now there's one sort of special type of inversion that is pretty critical to severe weather forecasting and that is called the elevated mixed layer or EML. And the elevated mixed layer is a layer of warm dry air or steeper lapse rates that originates from the desert southwest and is advected or transported over a layer of, of slightly cooler, more moist air. And that helps cap the atmosphere on severe weather days so that you can allow instability to build. And when that elevated mixed layer finally does erode, uh, you often get explosive thunderstorm development. So the elevated part of this is the fact that it originates from the elevated terrain uh, in the desert southwest. And when we're, we talk about a mixed layer, we're talking about vertical mixing. So that occurs when there's strong surface heating. So let's say we have the sun. It's, you know, it's a clear day heating the surface. As that happens, as the surface heats up pretty intensely, you'll get vertical mixing to happen. So that means that stuff from above the surface gets mixed downward to the surface, and stuff at the surface gets mixed upward. So oftentimes if you have a moist air mass at the surface, so dew points that are pretty high, and you have slightly drier air above it, if you have strong vertical mixing, or strong surface heating, that drier air from aloft will get mixed downward, and you'll often see dew points decrease in the early to mid-afternoon. And that's the result of vertical mixing, and it is hence a mixed layer. So, and just uh, as a kind of side note here before we go on, just to review what a lapse rate is, we learned it a few videos ago, but the lapse rate is the rate of decrease of temperature with height, and it's measured in degrees Celsius per kilometer. So let's do an example here of an elevated mixed layer. We're going to take a look at three different soundings, uh, the first at Albuquerque, then Amarillo, then Norman, and we're going to go from the evening before the event here, which is the May 31st, 2013 event, so you weather geeks out there will know that date to be the El Reno, Oklahoma tornado that unfortunately, tragically killed Tim Samaras and his storm chasing team. So we're going to take a look at three different soundings here. We're going to start at um, Albuquerque at um, zero Z the previous night, so 7 p.m. the previous night, Amarillo the morning of the event, and then uh, the Norman, Oklahoma sounding in close proximity to that tornadic supercell the evening of the event. So let's go ahead and go to our soundings here. So we're starting at 0Z on uh, May 31st, so this would be May 30th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. So this is, this is the evening before the event at Albuquerque. So you'll notice here that we've got a very quite deep layer of very steep lapse rates here. The temperature is really decreasing with height pretty rapidly. Very warm, very dry air here that extends all the way up to 500 millibars, which is quite deep. So if we go from Albuquerque here to our Amarillo sounding, you'll notice in this portion of the sounding, whoops, You'll notice in this portion of the sounding, it's almost identical to what we saw at Albuquerque. Well, that's because the air at Albuquerque, this that mixed layer at Al Albuquerque, has been invected to the east thanks to the mid-level winds. And it's called elevated because we know Albuquerque is at a much higher elevation than Amarillo. So it kind of stays put at that same elevation. We kind of see evidence of that morning inversion that we were talking about a few minutes ago. So that layer of steep lapse rates, that elevated mixed layer, is just above the surface here at Amarillo. And then we'll go to the evening of the event, so June 1st at 0Z, which would be 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on May 31st. And you'll notice here that this layer is almost identical to what we saw at Amarillo, because it's, again, continued to be advected to the east by the mid-level winds. And so you have this sort of elevated mixed layer, which has now somewhat eroded. As a note here, the sounding gets cut off at the top because it was actually launched into the anvil of the El Reno tornadic supercell that was ongoing. So it may have been struck by lightning. Who knows what happened to it, but the instrument package got destroyed and stopped recording here at about 250 millibars. But 
nonetheless, we can still see the elevated mixed layer here. So if we go back here in time, we'll start at Albuquerque, keep an eye on this layer here. You'll notice that it stays pretty consistent throughout time here as we get to the evening of the event. And earlier in the, earlier in the day, before this EML is eroded, it gets allows instability to build, and uh, once that EML is eroded, uh, it allows explosive thunderstorm development. So just to wrap this up here, we'll go and kind of uh, transpose the Amarillo sounding from 12Z on top of our Norman sounding here. So Amarillo is in black and white. I'm going to put it on top of the Norman Oklahoma sounding here. And you can see in this layer here, you can see it's almost absolutely identical to the Amarillo sounding from 12Z. And that's your elevated mix layer. So you can go back in time and trace the elevated mix layer on a severe weather day. And it's, it's a very critical type of inversion when we're talking about severe weather and the potential for explosive thunderstorm development in the afternoon. So now we're going to discuss some features of the skew t that help us assess moisture content of the atmosphere, particular, particularly whether, whether the atmosphere is saturated or dry. And it's pretty simple, where when the, the closer the temperature profile line and the dew point profile line are to each other, the more moist the atmosphere is. And if they're really close together, that's often an indication of clouds. Because we know when we have a cloud that the, the temperature has cooled to the dew point and the water vapor has condensed. So if we're looking at our sample sounding here on the right, this layer above about 400 Mill, 400 millibars or so, 450 millibars or so, pr is fairly saturated, very, very moist. The dew point profile is very close to the temperature profile. So there's probably a pretty decent layer of high clouds here, as well as here at low levels. So up to about 850 millibars, which, and we'll talk about this more in a second uh, in a little more detail, but probably some low clouds as well. And if we look at our satellite image from, from around this time that the sounding was taken, we can see here that there was plenty of high clouds and perhaps some low clouds underneath these high clouds. A little bit hard to tell from this visible satellite image, but nonetheless, there was a layer of clouds here, uh, most likely indicated by this sort of moist layer here and then at the near the surface, just above the surface there. And when the dew point line and the temperature profile are farther apart, that's when you have drier air. So this layer between about 850 millibars and 450 millibars or so is pretty dry. We can see that the uh, dew point profile is, is quite separated from the um, temperature profile. So your air is a lot drier in this layer than it is, say, in this layer above 450 millibars. And just a quick side note, this is an example of an elevated mix layer here. We won't trace this one back, but if we did go back um, to soundings out to the west, so perhaps you know Midland, Odessa, uh, and Albuquerque, you would see this kind of elevated mix layer here uh, in some shape or form. So this layer here that extends from the surface up to about 850 millibars is called the moist layer. And the moist layer is a pretty important thing to look at when we're talking about the quality of moisture for a severe weather event. And we want to see more of a deep moist layer than a shallow moist layer. So let's say we have at the surface here, um, let's say we have pretty good dew point for severe weather. Let's say it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit. But only about 100 meters up, it really starts to dry, and you have very dry air above that. Well, that would be an example of a shallow moist layer. And this is an example of a shallow moist layer here. You'll notice that the moist layer here only extends up to about 900 millibars from the surface, which is about 975 millibars. So very shallow moist layer here. You'll notice quite a bit of dry air above this moist layer. And as a result, the moisture quality in this scenario is pretty poor. Um, and this is important because if we are looking, let's say, a, a couple days ahead of a severe weather event and we're trying to track the advection or the transport of moisture in the low levels, 
And we see soundings like this in our source region, which for a typical Southern Plains setup would be, you know, the Gulf of Mexico. So soundings in Southern Texas are pretty representative of our source region. So if we're looking at Southern Texas soundings, soundings and we see something like this, we would be pretty um, skeptical of decent moisture return because our quality of moisture is so poor here. Our moist layer is so shallow. We have a ton of dry air above this shallow moist layer. So the quality of moisture for any potential severe weather event may be in question if we had a sounding like this representative of our source region. Now if we go back to this sounding here at the right, this would be a um, deeper moist layer. So in a deep moist layer scenario, we have this, our surface, we have good do dew points at the surface, and that extends through a pretty big layer up in the atmosphere. As we see here, it extends all the way up to about 850 millibars, which is a, a fairly deep moist layer. So the deeper the moist layer, the more favorable the um, environment is, at least in terms of moisture, for severe storms, particularly supercells and tornadic supercells. And when we see a, an environment where the um, moist layer is shallow, so if we go to our other sounding here, when we have lots of dry air aloft, only a very shallow moist layer or no mo moist layer at the surface, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth in the next video, but when you have lots of dry air aloft and you have... Um, you have a thunderstorm ongoing and you have um, a downdraft full of precipitation, moisture. Well, that is going to evaporate when you have a shallow moist layer or a very dry profile because that all that moisture is going to evaporate once it hits that dry air. It's going to accelerate. You get storms that are more outflow dominant because you get that cooling through evaporation, that downburst, that downdraft accelerates and hits the ground and becomes outflow and could undercut any sort of tornadic circulation you might have within a supercell. But if, if you have a deep moist layer, that evaporational cooling is much less likely to occur. So therefore, you will have the possibility for more inflow dominant storms, which is uh, how most tornadic supercells um, are. So when we're looking at, an ass at assessing moisture quality, we want to see more of a deep moist layer here, um, such as in this case, as opposed to something like this, where the moist layer is very shallow and lots of dry air above it. So that should wrap it up for this video. Um, again, in the next video, we're going to talk about different skew tees for different environments. So some severe weather environments, some winter weather environments, and how you can tell perhaps what precipitation type you might get in a certain winter weather scenario, um, the potential for severe storms, um, from an instability perspective, from a thermodynamic perspective, uh, in severe weather setups, uh, etc. So be, to, be sure to, to uh, stay tuned for that one coming in the next few days. Hope you enjoyed this video, and we will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.